Hey guys, we're back live with Trail Run Coaching because Coach Reese and I are, are having some conversation behind the scenes and we thought it would be fun to share with everybody else, like what are our conversations behind the scenes? I mentioned in our last video that we could talk for hours. So here it is. We'll, we'll try not to make it hours, but here it is. So we were talking a little bit about, um, I know a lot of people just follow some sort of a generic training plan and it's just written with just miles. There's no guidance with it. So what are people to do with that? You know, are they, you know, so I think every person decides what they do with it. So I feel like people either get stuck in a rut and they're, if they understand the idea of easy running, they're just doing slow and easy all the time. But if they don't, they might be just in that gray zone where it's really not helping or hurting, you know, it's just kind of in between there, but it's not making you perhaps the get, getting you to the potential where you could be as a runner. So, um, so thoughts on that? Yeah, totally. Um, you know, like there's nothing wrong with the idea of developing some base miles and taking things really nice and, and really light right now and just kind of going out as necessary. That's, that's one method of doing it. Um, but I, I feel like this idea of periodization in somebody's plan um, is very ambiguous and it really takes like, it takes a lot of in-depth knowledge about like a sport and its, um, its requirements for success or a distance and its in, um, requirements for success and extrapolating that based on like, where is this runner right now? What kind of events are they building up towards? Um, because we all know that like, you know, if we have a fall, um, for example, I have an athlete who is going to be doing a fall 50 miler. It's his first um, 50 miler. I, I told him, I was like, let's not even put that in our minds right now because we have so much that we can work on that is going to aid in your 50 mile performance without necessarily just being a ton of, you know, 50 mile style efforts. Right. So like right now, right. like him and I are going to be going through some, um, some heavier efforts. We're going to be working on his like upper ceiling. Um, so that way, as the, the months transition into like his closer to his 50 mile race, we're going to work on his, his upper end, his mechanics, his sprinting mechanics, his fast paced mechanics, and then transitioning that into the more specific um, quote unquote, like slower um, running. Right. And I, I say that with quotes just because there's a lot of people out there that are running 50 miles really quickly. And, um, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll see as the months go on where, where his potential lies there, but it would be erroneous. Right. To hold, say, hold up. So a yeah. lot of people, I think I'm talking to somebody right here that ran like what, six minute pace at your 50 mile. <laughs> wait, wait, what was that? Right. I said, I think I'm talking to somebody right here that ran what six minute pace for your 50 mile. Oh, it was, yeah. I think it <laughs> out to be like 720 or something like oh, okay. that. Okay. But still. <laughs> so it was, Fast. yeah. So, I mean, like all, all of that is to say, like, I think it's erroneous to, to, to think that like, okay, I have this goal in September. So I'm only going to work on this very one small slice of my entire aerobic capability. Like our body doesn't like to stick in one type of intensity for too long because you're going to get a lot of adaptations really quickly within, you know, um, generously like three to eight weeks, and then you're going to plateau and then you need to transition into some other area of your fitness. So we have this broad continuum of our aerobic system. You have your, let's see, which end am I on your high end over here and then your low end over here. So it's like, if we're doing nothing, but like working on our hundred mile pace, we're just working on this low end and we're completely neglecting all of these other intermediary and higher end um, type of type of uh, aerobic intensities that still demand oxygen, demand your muscles to be working and whatnot. Um, but if we only focus on one thing for too long, our body gets really great at that one thing at the expense of losing everything, not losing everything else, but developing less proficiency in those other areas. So kind of like what I was getting at before with the gait analysis, like when we're running our long distances, like the paces might be slow in a hilly hundred miler, but that's when we go uphill, our intensities increase. And if the intensity increases, your body needs to be able to produce energy at that harder intensity. So, um, you know, if all we're doing is right now in, in the middle of winter, just running our slow speeds, we're not conditioning our, our metabolic system to be able to produce efficient energy at those, those higher speeds or higher intensities. We're not, um, conditioning our muscles either to be able to handle, um, you know, higher intensities. So I think like, you know, right now, like if all you do is focus on this low, slow, um, you know, I'm only doing easy runs throughout the week, like not only can like just one type of intensity lead to like mental burnout and fatigue and like, oh, I don't want to go slog another like 10 minute pace. 
in the 20 degree weather, you know, but you're not going to be conditioning your muscular system for these races that you want to do in the future. And I mean, like the older I get, the quicker time flies. So now I'm thinking I'm like the end of 2023 <laughs> is like right around the corner. Like what the heck, you know? So, um, I think it's this blend of, you know, um, prioritizing certain intensities at certain periods of the year without neglecting anything else. So I think like us coaches, it's so important to think or to not think that like, oh, somebody's A event is five, six months away, seven months away. So we're only going to work on, you know, back-to-back long runs and this and that, and only, you know, 50 or hundred mile workouts as we would prescribe them, but focus on um, some other areas that we can, we can develop fitness too. Because when we look at this continuum of aerobic fitness, if we work at the high end, if we work at the low end, we're still working our ability, our ability to process and utilize oxygen for energy development for forward propulsion, you know? So right, right. Um, I know for me, it's like, if all I did was do nothing, but, you know, quote unquote, like slower or less intense running throughout the winter, I feel like, man, I want something fun. I want something a little poppy, nothing too stressful, but something to just condition a different part of my physiology that will eventually translate into these races I'm looking to do in, at the later part of the year. Right. So, so I got a couple of things here. I, I just got to call you out on this reason I, right here on Facebook live. Mm. So he just says he's getting older. You know, he's probably the youngest one in our group and he can't remember to tell us when he's in or out. We, we share this uh, program together and forever. Reese says, I promise I'll tell you when I'm going out. It's gone. I'm like, man, he's the youngest in our group and he's losing his mind. You know, you can beat me up all day because I beat myself up about it too. I, I get so forgetful with that, but you know, I get so eager to get in and like work on my program, my athletes programs. And then, you know, by the time I get out, it's like, I'm already running late for something else because I just love like looking and analyzing other people. Like, um, I always laugh, I always laugh when you go and I'm like, yep, we're not going to know when he's out. No. Um, I do appreciate the text message reminders though. Like, Hey, are you still in? Uh, sometimes I am Hello? in for like an hour and a half, like two hours. Um, so that's great. Like you know. Recovery. Honestly, I love talking about this. Like I just got back from a long run this morning and it's like, Oh, what better way to, you know, cool down and, you know, get ready for the next part of my day with some coffee and some good conversation about training. Like, it's fun. There you go. Yeah. Get you all revved up for the next run. So um, one of the things you mentioned that I think about a lot is when you're talking about periodization and we get athletes that come in really close to a race and want us to get them ready for a race, it's a little challenging as a coach, right? I mean, <laughs> what do, we can't really periodize that. We're no, in so, the point so of, you know, um, more race focus at that point. Reason being, like, I think about, like, race performance, um, and again, performance meaning whatever you want it to mean. If that means I'm going for first place, I'm going for first record, or I'm going for my best day, or I'm going for a certain time, performance is performance. So when I say performance, don't think, I'm just thinking about the front of the pack. I'm thinking about performing for whatever your best goal is. Um, so when we talk about, like, performance in our races, um, I always think about it in two fronts. There's the, like, physical conditioning side. And then that's like the hard skills in ultra running. Like you, you have to have a certain level of physiological durability, um, you know, or other physiological parameters to execute your goals. But at the same time, there's a lot of soft skills that we need as, as ultra runners. So if you come in a couple of weeks or even a month out, even two months is still like still too short. Um, you are going to get no physiological adaptation. Um, it takes a long time for the body to develop these structures. Um, and to reap the rewards of consistent training, because we all should know, um, you know, that consistency in training is going to lead to the best possible outcomes for sure. Um, so if somebody comes in and they only have like four, you know, four to eight weeks or so, that's a couple weeks to get some good training in. But then like, if you really wanted to see like adaptation, you're going to have to take a couple weeks taper. And it's just not going it, to, it's not a long enough time horizon for your body to do the beautiful things that you're asking it to do, such as physically make new structures like mitochondria, um, you know, increase its capillary density or develop different um, forms of muscle fibers. Uh, it's just not enough time. It is enough time on the soft skill sides. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, how are we going to execute the race? What is your strategy? Right. How are you right. going to go in and out of the aid stations? How are we going to practice aid station efficiency? Um, just to plug one of my articles that I wrote about aid station efficiency, how can we get there and not spend a ton of time, um, not 
being forward propellant. Um, you can also work on like gear, like how does this gear fit me? I'm trying something new. I'm trying a different fueling source. You can work on those softer side skills that um, don't pertain to your physical conditioning. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, if somebody, I mean, like right now is really the best time to be thinking about right. what's coming up in the middle of summer and what's coming up at the end of fall. Those are the two biggest, sure. um, two biggest time frames that people have races. A lot of people run spring races too, but if you're going to be right. running spring races, like I hope that you have been working with the coach, um, you know, because now is kind of, um, that crunch time, you know, between now to, you know, April, if you have like an April race, a May race, whatever it is, or even a March race, if it's closer on the horizon, you should, should have a bulk of your training already kind of like wrapped and packaged up for sure. So right, right. talk about like summer and fall training and racing. Now we're talking about like, Hey, we have four months before June. Um, you know, that is a great block. If you want to start training for kettle, um, you know, you can really kind of hone in at these different intensities that you're going to need for kettle. You can hone in on the durability that it's going to take to complete whatever distance you're looking to go for. Um, and you know, for your fall races, I would say, you know, if you're, if you have a fall race on the calendar, don't even think about it right now. Um, because if you think about it right now, you're going to do nothing but train. Like if you're like me, you're type A, you're going to do nothing but train for it. You're <laughs> going to do nothing but think about it for the next, you know, eight, nine months or so. And, um, you're going to get stale. You're going to burn out. So I would choose these like intermediary goals or these, these goals that are like more like five to six months out in time horizon. And that's the best time to like, you know, be talking with a coach about like, what do you need to be more successful? Right, right. And I mean, it's a good opportunity for a coach to help support you through training cycles to get you to that fall race. That gives you ample time. So mm -hmm. you're not, I think one of the things that we're always struggling against is that fine balance between um, risk and risk and reward, right? If we start pushing those miles fast, then we're you know headed towards a path of potential injury. So we always have to have that balance. So I, I think that, you know, yes, we could help you in a short amount of time, but ideally that longer time is going to get you to the goals and the things that you want safer, I think, and more enjoyable. Yeah. If somebody, if somebody comes to me and they're like, Hey, I have this race in a month, I will do everything that I can to help you perform for sure. But that's going to relate more to soft skill things while your plan is going to build up more towards like, okay, maybe we're not going to hit this race like dead on the money, but we're going to be building towards another a race that you have in the future. And I'm sure that like, you're, you're probably the same way too, Loretta. It's like, if somebody comes to you and it's like, I have a race in two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, it's like, okay, you're already spinning the dials on like, how am I going to help them right now? And what yes. is going to be like best for them in the moment. But like, as coaches, like we can't make people's bodies adapt better. We can't yes, make people's yes. bodies recover better. And that's the time horizon that we're kind of succumb to when you're talking about endurance training. It's, right, it's right. A, and I mean, and we want to help you and it's, you know, we're doing everything that we can and we're going to give you all that we have, but, mm -hmm. but we're, I mean, the, my magic wand broke a long time ago. I don't know if you have one, but mine, mine kind of broke. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. And you know, like, um, I guess, I guess like it's better that people like ask it, it especially if they have a lot of questions or if they're new to the sport it's, it's better that they ask definitely they, they come in at some point even if their race is a couple weeks away yes um yes. but I think any it's, point will take you and we'll help you yeah <laughs> but, yeah yeah um but i think that's where like setting like realistic expectations is such a big thing like on our end too of like hey like you know this is this is how we can help you for whatever you got coming up if if it's a couple months in the horizon, then cool. We have more tools and more time to get your body ready for it and to get your right, mind ready, right. and get your skills ready. Um, so I think it's cool, um, you know, that um, there's been a handful of athletes that I, I just started working with in the past couple of weeks that are thinking about their, um, their middle of summer and fall time events, their whole 2023 season. So I think that's a re really cool push in uh, the ultra running community is thinking more instead of like, when's my next race as opposed to like, thinking like, okay, how is my 2023 going to turn out? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that is exciting. I think that's one of the things that I like most of, about coaching is sitting down and talking with athletes and figuring out what is their goal? What do they want to do this year? You know, it's like they have this whole year to decide, right? What all of the things that they want to do. And we know that ultra running is getting so much, um, 
more attention and people are are signing up for these races and races are filling up so we have to make some decisions early or we might be waitlisted yeah absolutely and i think too you know like with the increased popularity and this is just kind of like a side tangent now I, as, yeah, as I know. this <laughs> informal conversation is going um you know, like I think, you know, with a lot of the newer people that are coming into the sport, like it's it's a sport that's like, it's it's addictive. Like I I personally love it. I think about it all the time. I love human performance. I love optimization. Um, you know, but I think for people just getting into the sport, getting that bug in their ear of like, hey, you know, like with such a physical physically exert. It, a physically demanding type of sport like we need to be prepared like in the mind in the body so that way we don't run ourselves into the ground um incur you know hormonal dysregulation um um you know um incur soft tissue damages and whatnot um that can that can ultimately impact our health and well-being so i think that's too where like you know as coaches i feel like for everybody for all the new people coming into the sport it's huge to just get that personal experience of like hey this is how you're going to want to train so that you don't burn yourself out. You don't get these injuries. You don't like, you know, succumb to a decreased quality of life, you know? Right. Right. So. You know, one of the, I think one of the challenges that I like a lot about coaching too is helping people with busy schedules, figure out how to make it work. Right. You know, we were talking earlier, Reese, you have a new job. You're really busy. I mean, how are you making it work right now? Did, you know, that was a change for you. Some days I wonder that myself. I, um, okay. So like time management is huge for me. And in the last live stream that we, we did our, um, you know, I was talking about my kind of my morning routine right now, but, um, you know, I work, um, just over 40 hours a week at a clinic out here. Um, Mondays and Wednesdays, I work 12 hour days with a couple hour break in between Tuesdays and Thursdays. I work one to seven. So that's why we're doing, we did this podcast or we did this live stream now. Um, so, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays, if I'm going to go long, that's going to be when I'm going to do it. You know, um, I'm not really sacrificing too much time with, um, with my girlfriend. I get up early and I'm off the door and I get home and we can spend some time together. And then by the time the weekend comes, you know, like, sure, I have more time in the day, but I do like to spend it with her. So we're going to go out onto the trails or hang out and visit family, whatever it is. So I'm trying not to sacrifice on any of my work. Um, I'm trying not to sacrifice on my home life and my family life. Um, but that means too that like, hey, you know, like I understand there's a lot of like stress is stress, you know, mental stress is right, right. You know, so right. I try to keep like my Monday through Friday as like least uh, mentally stressful as possible. You know, I like to go in to work and my job's not crazy stressful. It's basically what I do here. I just talk to other people, take them through exercise routines, talk body science. This is stuff that I love. It's not mentally Do so you play all day? Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> it's nice for active recovery, but sometimes it is a physically demanding job. So, you know, like yep. on my Mondays and Wednesdays, I'll go out for about like a 10 mile run on my lunch. Um, I get two hours for lunch. So it's just time management things, right? Like work a five hour day, go out and run the miles that I can run without stressing. If I can't, like if we have a work meeting or whatever, just if I can get some miles in awesome. If I can't try not to sweat it too much. Um, but I'm going to try as hard as I can to get those miles in for sure. I'm on right, right. Tuesdays and Thursdays. I go outside and I play in the morning. It just sucks that it's been so dark out, you know? So right. on a beautiful yeah. day like today, it's nice. Um, and then the weekends, it's like, you know, grab some miles if, if I can and, you know, hang out with uh, my girlfriend that likes to run and go visit family. And um, yeah, I guess like at the end of the day, it's like understanding that your physical stress, your running stress, your mental stress, life stress, work stress, family stress, like, there's only so much of the pie that you can dish out at once. Your body can only handle so much stress, whether it's mental or physical. So right. if you're going to be right. running hard, like I hope in the off times, like you're not too bound up, you're not too wound up, you know? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think keeping stress low and time management is huge. It's why I try to run most days just straight out the door, because if I can cut down, you know, driving 20 minutes out, parking, getting my stuff, you know, like going out for like two or three hours and coming that's like a five hour investment in the day. If, and if I work at one o'clock in the afternoon, it's like, even if I get up at five, like, I don't want to get back at like 10, 11, 12, you know, like, right. So right. Yeah. I think getting the miles in when you can, not stressing about it when you can't trying to keep the rest of your life stress and balance. Um, and just trying to like have fun with every training run. Of course, not everything's going to go like peachy keen, but like if 
more often than not, you're having a good time and you find the value and why you are out there doing whatever you're doing. I think you're on the path to success because just keeping that mental stoke alive will just help that cycle just keep repeating. So that way you keep getting up at five o'clock in the morning, you keep going out when it's dark, like you keep, you keep um, eating, eating well and um, thinking well and de-stressing and not letting life get to you and whatnot. So I think positivity begets positivity and it's just the cycle of like, let's just keep this positive, positive momentum rolling forward. So um, yeah, that's a lot about my life, but I mean, like, how yeah. about you? Like, what is, what is proper training and um, time management and stress? Like, how does that all manifest? In right, you? right. So my life has changed a lot over the last couple of years. Um, I had a full-time position where I was, you know, in to work every day. And that was a lot different for time management for me is figuring out you know, when am I going to run and work 40 to 50 hours or plus a week, right? And um, I think it also has evolved as my children have moved away. So I, you know, you gain time here and there. And I think that I feel like busy people make it happen. It, you know, I, I feel like if they want to make it happen, it's going to happen. And, you know, some of the things I, I suggest to my athletes is bring your gear with you, change. I mean, one of the things I used to do, I would change right at work. So on the way home, I would stop at a trail because sometimes once you get home, you get tired and you're like, oh, I can't get back out there. But if you have your gear on, you're ready to go. And that was something that kept me going all day because I was so excited to change into my running clothes to go for a run after work, you know, um, or if you can sneak it in during a lunchtime. Um, I was actually laughing because one of my um, running friends, I've been working with her a little bit on strength training and when I had my office at work, I had kettlebells under my desk. So I was doing kettlebell workout during um, my lunch breaks, right? And and she was thinking of doing that and she thought she was crazy. I'm like, well, I guess I am too because I do the same thing. You know, um, now life has changed and I do mostly just um, my remote coaching and then running and, and training for myself. And so, of course, I spend a lot of hours doing that, but I have a lot more flexibility in my schedule. So I do have a running friend who is um, a young mom. She has two, two little ones. And so I think it's important to um, help the community and I want her out there running. And so I, I've been adjusting my schedule kind of around nap time or whatever works, you know, I'm like, don't stress, text me when you're on your way to the trail, I'll go meet you there, you know? And so that's another fun thing that I'm able to do because I have a little bit of flexibility, but I work with lots of moms. Um, who sneak in things like during um, nap time, maybe it's a treadmill run because they can't get outside because their kids are sleeping. But, you know, we make it happen. Sometimes it's splitting up runs and having to run um, twice in the day because they didn't have enough time in the morning before work, but they have a little more time after work, but can't do it all together at once. You know, so there's a lot of creative things I think you can do with your training to make it still happen. If your dream is to do it, then you can make it happen. And I think having a coach does help you with that, you know, gives you a little bit of ideas for, you know, flexibility, but, you know, I'm enjoying right now transition, right? So I'm kind of in between, um, in planning my, my 2023 schedule and really enjoying focusing on strength training and having the time, a little bit more time to really take with that. I, I love heavy strength. Um, my favorite movement is probably deadlifts. I just absolutely love them. So um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. But I've also, with that, my, I've decreased my volume of running um, to, and, and tuned up the uh, intensity. So that gives me a lot more time on my hands. That's dangerous. <laughs> like, what is the runner going to do? Because she's got a lot of time on her hands. So, uh, you know, before we went on, I was talking to Reese about you know, I started doing some painting and, and repotting plants. And, you know, it's kind of nice because I feel like I'm using my creative side of my brain that sort of has been on rest because I've been so focused on running and data and, and all of that piece. It's nice to kind of change that around. And also, I'm going to go back to that book, um, Do Hard Things, because I, I think about that a lot because that's what we've been talking about. And I've taken more time during the last few days as I'm doing these things to stay away from technology and to stay in my own head. And, you know, painting is not something that's easy for me. Planting pots is not something that's easy for me. I don't know that stuff. So I have to, you know, it's, it's kind of think through that, right? So it's making me tougher outside of running because I'm, I'm having to use skills that I'm not used to using, you know? So I think, you know, there's just so many things you can do just in everyday life to make yourself a stronger runner, not just running. That's, that's huge. And like what you were talking about before, like with the kettlebells and just trying to sneak in some like movements in like, 
you know, like, I kind of like to go away from the word workout because I feel like it, you know, it's, it's got this idea of like, it's gotta be 60 to 90 minutes of, you know, like being in the gym and lifting weights and, you know, doing this. And it's like, there's a lot of times that like people don't have that in their day. And if anybody yes. follows me on Strava, it's like, you'll see that like two to three days a week, like I'm posting like 15 minute, like I call them my sneaky fitness sessions where they're like less than 15 minutes. It's a lot of like full body, like type of circuits, like overhead pressing rows, some RDLs, just kind of wake my body up in the morning and the days where I don't start the day with a run, you know? So, and it's like, is that going to be um, like enhancing my running? Well, by keeping like a healthy body for sure, you know? So right, I, think, right. I think that's huge. If you can get these movement snacks throughout the day, that's great. And then like, like you were talking about before, it's like um, that mental putting yourself in these positions where it's like, you're not, you're not experienced at something. You're a beginner at something like, but still like finding the resources to teach yourself or to yes. find other people that know more than you, or to even just begin to try, like, is just such yep, a yep. huge mental, um, it's, it's a mental hurdle that a lot of people have to get over just being new and right. being it's just kind of getting outside of your comfort zone. Something. Yeah. Right? Getting out of that comfort zone because that happens. Let's face it in races, you're out of your comfort zone. And what are you going to do? Yeah, are you the mental skills. Panic, is or are you going to get it together? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so huge. Um, I think it's huge too. Like, um, you know, just having something in this off season because just like it's very healthy for us to train and increase our performance. Like, you know, it, it's also very healthy to detrain a little bit so that your body yes. can recoup and recover and you know, replenish, um, you know, um, re re replenish bone mineral density, replenish, you know, damages and soft tissue, um, you know, have the muscles recover. So a lot of us runners are out there running from anywhere from like, you know, I'd say like three hours at the low end to like 15 to 20 hours at the high end, you know, like, and if you're at the high end and all of a sudden you're like, you know, only going out for an hour or two, three, four, five a week, when you're used to spending 20 outside a week, it's like, yeah, 15 hours of a lot of, you know, what do I do with myself? Uh, exactly. And that's where I was left. So that's why I turned to potting and dotting. <laughs> potting and dotting. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I think, I, I think we'll wrap it up here quickly because like I said, we could talk all day. One of the things that I like to think in my head too is I like to more like reframe my mindset is to, I get to do these things. Not that I have to do these things. Because when you start thinking about you have to, then we kind of get into that negative piece of it becomes more of a, a job or a task than something you want to do. And I think most of us really love running. That's why we're here. And so it's something we get to do. Like I get to go for a run today, you know, and I think that can, can change your attitude. I think sometimes we get into that rut of I have to because I'm training for something or my coach told me to do it. It's, it's not, that's not what it's about. Yeah. And I totally understand too that like, not every run is going to be like, you know, peaches and cream. And like, there's going to be days where it's like, I'm tired. Like, but I, I feel like, I feel like every run, like you should be able to find the value in doing what you're doing. And I think that's right. where the, ex the excitement comes the, or the happiness comes from is finding the value in, in what you're doing. It might not be valuable right now because you're like, you know, in negative six degree weather, like, you know, and, and whatever. Um, that was my example from a couple of days ago. I was in negative six degree weather and I thought to myself, like, <laughs> what is the value in doing this? If I'm going so slow and everything hurts, I'm going to cut my workout down from my long run, just do 10 miles, got home, did some hip stuff, did some hamstring stuff to work on this other area of my, you know, my, my physical fitness that can be a, a weak link in my running and, you know, ca call it a day and wait for a warmer day so that I can actually get some big training miles. Um, but if you can still find the value whenever you're out there, you know, like it's, um, I think that's huge, whether you're yeah, like, I think so this is, this is fun or, you know, like, oh, man, like today's just a mental grind. As long as you can still find that value and like, I'm out here working for something and that's fulfilling. I say that's game on, you know? Absolutely. I don't think that I can say I've ever really regretted a run once I've done it either. Right. You know, I'm always like so glad that I went out for that run when, and maybe mm -hmm. I was, being pulled to stay inside because it was cold or, or, or hot or whatever. Yeah. It might not be ha ha fun, like in the time, but it's valuable in it. Yeah. That's, that's just the way my, my brain has been going these past couple of weeks, you know? Right. That kind of brings me back. I, I said we were going to stop, but it kind of brings me back to a conversation we had last night about, um, have you ever been bored on a run? 
mm-hmm. right? Do you get bored on a run? It just says it seems impossible to me. <laughs> and and for for the listeners and the viewers, this is why conversations between Reese and Loretta last um, <laughs> decades. Um, you say we're going to sign off, and then like, oh, but I want to oh, say yeah, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's awesome because that's such a great point. Like you know, and it's something that we were talking about last night, and it's like, you know. <sighs> I can't really find, like, even if I'm not listening to music, like, I'm always thinking about something. Like, I'm thinking about my body, my stride, how things feel. What does my ankle feel like? What do my knees feel like? How about my hips, my shoulders? Um, you know, are my hands tired of carrying my water bottles? Whatever it is. Or I'm thinking, like, oh, this is beautiful scenery. Um, you know, like, I'm really enjoying myself. This is great to have a nice sunny day. We haven't seen this in a long time. Um, or if it's just like, you know, sometimes I'll just have music going through my head. So I think the brains are really shapeable um, type of type of thing where, you know, like a lot of people would think that they would get bored if they've never put themselves in that circumstance and actually let their brain like try to occupy the time and occupy the um, enjoyment. Right. Absolutely. And I do 24 hour races. I do 100 mile races. Never been, never been bored. Mm-hmm. But one of the other things, um, just a tip I have is I've always told myself, especially when I was working um, a full-time position and it was, you know, sort of a stressful position that I was not going to think about run work when I ran. I, I wanted that out of my head because that wasn't something I wanted to spend my whole time doing, which is kind of interesting because I sometimes it would sneak back into my head trying to solve a work problem. But if I would push it out and think about other things, it was interesting how later after my run, I probably solved my problem not even thinking about it. I all of a sudden had this solution later. So I, I really, I think that it's good because sometimes we need to turn our brain off of everyday life and just go out and enjoy the trails. I've had, I've had that experience and I have that experience more often than not, but have you ever had the experience where there's something in life that's really stressful and it like during your run, it's like, it occurs at mile one and then it'll occur at mile three and then maybe mile seven to the point where it's like, okay, now I've thought about, it's come into my brain about three or four times and I've tried to push it out. Um, So there's been times where it's like, I'll just sit there and think about everything in that situation that makes me anxious, anything that I need to do, anything, you know? So it's almost like, this is my space to think about Mm -hmm. the one thing that I'm trying not to think about, you know? And then it's like, okay, cool. I really let those emotions hit me. I really let the problem solving come. And then that issue just kind of, instead of me forcing it away, it just right, right. Fades away because oh, no, that's I thought about it enough. It's just too, kind of right. Gone. So don't ignore it. Take I it think on. There's so many cool different ways yep. that our brain can like handle these um, right. problems in our run and outside of our run. Um, that like, yeah, I don't think I've, I've ever gotten bored. And sometimes it's like you're running and it's like you just think of something that happened like 10 years ago and it's like, wow, I never really had a reason to think about why think about that before. Right, but, right. You know, yep. um, to bring up that memory, it's it's strange. So yeah, yeah. Really you know, I think that there. we need to go on a long, a really long run together. You know, one time mom, I was running with friends and I'm like, I think we need to have this podcast and it's, it's called the long run. So you're just out running, recording, whatever you're talking about on the long run, you know, mm-hmm. because so many good cop- topics come up and I think we could run for like a hundred miles together, just talking about nonsense. <laughs> oh my gosh. That would be great. What if we <laughs> did that? That'd be crazy. We, we should, we should do, do like that. Video, we need to figure like out how to make this quarter happen. and just, yeah. 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 <laughs> Maybe go pro on our heads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you I think it'd be fun. And we'd have to use your strategy of go out and fend for yourself. You have no food, you have no water, figure out how this is going to work. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. For the listeners. Like a survivor. <laughs> yeah. The, the background of this was um, Loretta and I were talking about cycling and running. And I was talking about a lesson that I learned from cycling is that like, you know, like you, like sometimes if you're going to go out for, you know, five, six, seven hours, you're not going to be able to physically carry everything unless you have a huge backpack and like who wants to be weighted down, like on the, on the ride, you know? So like, while you're riding, you'll think of, you'll know when you go out on the ride, okay, I don't have enough to last the six hours or the hundred miles that I want to do on my century ride. So you think to yourself while you're cycling, okay, how many calories do I have? How much water do I have about when am I going to run out? Like, where is the nearest gas station? And you start to problem solve more. Um, and you get this really cool idea of, okay, what, what kind of taste palette do I have under heavy fatigue? Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, like when you're cycling, you'll get to a gas station and be like, I have no idea what I want, but you just start walking towards a direction. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's great. Okay. So you, 
you get these cool like visions or these ideas of like, okay, this, if I'm under this much fatigue, this is generally the types of foods I'll go for. What, what do you choose? Oh, for me, it's like cliff bar. It's like savory stuff, like savory, slightly sweet. I love cliff bars. Um, yeah. I mean, like I'll choke down booze and like, um, like chewy fruity things, but like, man, like give me some like chocolate and some good savory yep. stuff. And yep. like, I'm totally happy. Um, but translating that to running is like, okay, like how can we practice adaptability? Because of course we, we have this strategy of going into these long races of like, this is exactly how it's going to pan out. And it never pans out like that. So you might find yourself at mile 70 without any food or water. And now you're at the aid station. You, you don't have any of your personal calories. So you have to, you know, like see what they have, you know? So my idea was starting these long runs with like purposefully, safely without um without enough water or without enough food so that way while we're running and we're doing a particular route we're thinking to ourselves okay when am i going to run out where are the nearest gas stations or do i bring a filter do i fill up at a stream like you know and just practice not having every variable specifically dialed but being able to adapt to different situations and of course every caveat on under the books if you decide to do that like you know make sure somebody knows where you're going to be at like carry your phone <laughs> in case you're in trouble maybe carry some backup calories that you plan on. Like, okay, like I'm not going to take these unless it's an emergency, just so I can practice my adaptability. Um, you know, all that good stuff, do it safely. Put your money in a Ziploc bag because it's really embarrassing when you walk up to the counter and you have sopping wet money you have to exchange for, for things. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. might have happened a time or two to me. Exactly. <laughs> Dripping wet money. Here you go. <laughs> exactly. So. All right. We probably should wrap it up with that. Um, so. Thank you for spending a little bit more time with us. And this is the uh, behind the scenes, the brains of uh, <laughs> Reese and Loretta, the way we think, a little scary. The disjointed rambling of multiple right. topics. So hopefully the viewers can extract some golden nuggets and try to apply it into their running and whatnot. But for sure. For this sure. Be really fun to continue too, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, I'll talk to you later, Reese. Sounds good. Thanks Bye. for having me.